Hi, in this video we'll be talking about metaprogramming in Scala 3 and how you can metaprogram with the new inline keyword that is new to Scala 3. My name is Maxine Carey and I'm with the Scala Center. The topics that we'll look at are metaprogramming in Scala 3 in general, and specifically we'll introduce the new inline keyword. We'll take a look at why this new inline keyword allows you to do metaprogramming. And finally, we'll take a look at some more advanced inlining tricks that you can do with inline. But first, let's answer the question, what is a metaprogram? A metaprogram is a program that manipulates other programs. So for instance, if you're writing a regular program, you might take some data as input and output some other data. For instance, you take two numbers and you compute the sum. When you're writing a metaprogram, you take a program as input, and you might output another program. An example of this is if you take a program P as input, and you output a program Q that executes P, and then prints how long it took to run P. And actually, we'll be writing this program later in this video. What are some of the uses of metaprogramming? One possible use is to generate code so that you don't have to write too much boilerplate. Another possible use is to analyze existing code in order to search for errors. We can also take an existing program and output another program, which is more performant as the first program, but does the same thing. Or we can try to run some of the runtime computation at compile time instead. And actually, these last two goals are things that we will be writing in this video. In Scala 3, metaprogramming has been redesigned. The design principle here is that simple programs should be easy to express, but more complex metaprograms should be possible to express and should have access to the right low-level primitives. In this video, we'll take a look at a feature that goes towards the first goal of making simple metaprograms easier to express. So we'll be looking at the inline keyword. We'll not be looking at more advanced features such as macros, the reflect API, or runtime multi-stage programming, which are meant for more complex metaprograms. All right, let's dive in. The inline modifier can be used before the keyword def to mean that we want to move an implementation from the definition sites to the call sites. So here we have a small example in which we greet uh, somebody. Here, the definition site is the def say hello. This is where we define the implementation of how to say hello. And the call site is the main method. This is where we call the say hello method. This is compiled to just a single line where we take the implementation and inline it into the main method. So why is this even useful? Well, you might say one use is for performance. We avoid the overhead of calling the say hello function, which is a tiny performance benefit. Um, but this is such a small performance win that it's not really the main use of inline defs. The main use is to unlock optimizations uh, that the compiler can do when it's inlining. And we'll take a look at many of these optimizations in this video. If you're coming from Scala 2, don't get confused. Inline is not the same as at inline. So Scala 3's inline keyword is a command to inline, while Scala 2's inline annotation is just a suggestion for the compiler to maybe inline this function. So what does this mean? It means that if we take this example in Scala 2 and use the inline annotation, the say hello method may or may not be inlined. It's not a guarantee. In Scala 3, we have this guarantee. We inline the function or we fail compilation. Let's now take a look at another place where you can use the inline keyword. You can use the inline keyword before a val to tell the compiler that a value is a compile time constant and usages can re be replaced with the actual value. So let's take a look at this in an example. In this example, we have a small piece of code um, in which we have a debug object with a flag enabled, a Boolean flag. And we have a time function, which depending on the value of debug.enabled, either 
runs an operation and prints how long it took, or it just runs the operation without timing it. Then in our main function, we wrap our call to do something inside of debug.time. Note here that op is a byname parameter, so it's only being executed when it's referenced inside of time and not before being passed to time. Let's now add the inline keywords. We know what an inline def is, but let's see what the compiler does with this inline val as well. The first step is always to inline the inline def. So we take the implementation of time and we place it inside the main. Note here that we replace all the parameters with the arguments that we were passing to debug.time. The next step is to inline the inline val. So we take the value of the inline val and we place it in the condition of the if. Now the compiler can see that we have an if with a constant condition, and we know that this will always evaluate to the, the else branch when the condition is false. So what we can do is just throw out the then branch and just keep the else branch. And now we're done. Let's see now what happens if we change the value of debug.enabled to true. The first step is the same as before. We inline the inline def. Then we need to inline the inline val. And this gives us an if with a constant condition. The compiler here again notices that we have an if with a constant condition and simplifies this to the then branch, throwing out the else branch. So let's recap this example. We just wrote some debug code that appears in our development build when we set the debug.enabled to true, but this appears in our production build when we set it back to false. And this is actually quite a powerful trick because we can debug an instrument or application with exactly zero overhead in production. Let's now take a look at a third place where we can use the inline keyword, and that is before an if. If you recall in our previous example, in step two, we simplified an if to the then branch or the else branch. But how can we be sure that the compiler is actually making this simplification? Well, it turns out that in Scala 3, there is a way to tell the compiler, it's actually very important to me that this if be simplified to either the then branch or the else branch. So please make sure that you do it. And if you can't do it for whatever reason, report a compilation error. So let's now add this inline keyword to our example before the if. What if the compiler cannot simplify this if? For instance, if we forget the inline before val. Let's see what the compiler does with this. Here, the compiler reports an error on the inline if, telling us that it could not be reduced to one of the two branches because the condition is not a compile time constant. So this shows us that the inline val really is necessary to tell the compiler that simplifications can be made. A fourth place where we can use the inline keyword is before a parameter of an inline def. So here we have a function where both the x and the y parameters are inline parameters. These inline parameters are mostly useful for more advanced use cases, such as macros, avoiding closure creation, propagating constant values in certain specific cases, or repeating code. To understand how these inline parameters work, let's take a look at a simple example. Here, we have a function called print thrice, which takes an integer x and prints it thrice. We now call in our main method print thrice with a random integer. Running this gives us the expected result, three times the same integer. What happens now if we make the parameter an inline parameter? Running this will give us three different integers. Why is this? To understand why, let's see what this compiles to. The result of the compilation includes three print statements that all call rand.nextint. This is because rand.nextint is inlined into the inline def, and the inline def is inlined into the main method. The conclusion here is that you should be very careful if you want to reuse an inline parameter, because this will duplicate code and you might execute things more times than you intended to. But if you're used to byname parameters, this is very much the same. A fifth and final place where you can use the inline keyword is before a match. An inline match is much like an inline if. If you recall our examples with inline if, the compiler was able to simplify an inline if into either the then branch or the else branch. Here, with an inline match, the compiler can simplify the match into one of its match cases. 
we have an example here um, where we take a parameter x, match on it. If it is a string, we return a tuple of x and x, and if it's a double, we just return x. And the main method, we call this test uh, function with a string. So this is inlined and simplified, and it returns just the tuple, the result of the match type, the tuple, hello, hello. Just like with an inline if, if the compiler is not able to simplify the match, it throws a compilation error. So in this case, we are calling the test method with a Boolean argument, which is not covered by the cases. And here, the compiler tells us that the scrutiny, so this is the term for the thing that we match on, is a Boolean, but that is not covered by the cases, so that cannot be simplified. Let's recap the types of inline that we've seen so far. Inline defs are used to move code from definition sites to use sites. Inline vals are used to move values from definition sites to use sites. Inline parameters are meant to move code from an argument into the function where it is used. Inline ifs ensure that an if can be simplified by the compiler. And inline matches ensure that matches can and will be simplified by the compiler. And finally, Remember that we have at inline, this is the odd one out. Uh, this is the Scala 2 annotation. So now that we've seen all the ways that you can use the new inline keyword, you might be wondering, how is this related to metaprogramming? To answer this, let's look at a simple example. Here's a simple implementation of the Fibonacci sequence derived from the mathematical formulation for it. This is definitely not the most efficient implementation for Fibonacci, but let's disregard that for now. And the main method we call Fibonacci of 10. So we're, trying, we're getting the 10th Fibonacci number. Let's try to see what this compiles to. The answer is that it compiles to println of 55. So you might be going, wait a second, did the compiler just evaluate my function call? And the answer is, yes, it did. But understanding why might not be so simple if you're just thinking about the inlining part. We've seen that we can inline code with inline def, inline val, and inline parameters, but there's also a simplification aspect with inline ifs and inline matches. And more formally, these are known as inlining and constant folding. And it just turns out that inlining plus constant folding gives us compile time evaluation, which is one of the goals of metaprogramming. Before we go any further, let's just do a quick primer on constant folding. Here are some examples of constant foldings that many compilers are able to do. So operations like one plus two can already be simplified by the compiler into three so that we don't have to run the addition at runtime. This is also true for other operations such as multiplications or comparisons, or even an if with a constant condition, as we've seen before in some of our examples. Okay, let's now try to understand how the compiler does this. So we have a much smaller example with just Fibonacci of two, and we'll try to work through this to understand what the compiler is doing. Always, the first step is to inline the def. So here, we just took the implementation of Fibonacci and put it into the main. We now have a comparison of constant values in the condition of the if. So the compiler can constant fold these to the result, which is false. We now have an if with a constant condition, so we can simplify this to the else branch. This gives us two subtractions of constant values, so we can constant fold those to the result. We can now inline the two defs of Fibonacci of 1 and Fibonacci of 0. Again, we have comparisons of constant values, so we can constant fold those. Again, an if with a constant condition, so we simplify these to their then branches. And now finally, we have an addition, which we can constant fold. This gives us 1, which is the second Fibonacci number. And we're done. In our original example, we computed the 10th Fibonacci number, which was 55. So we evaluated the function call of Fibonacci of 10. But remember that all of this constant folding and inlining is actually done at compile time and not at runtime. So this isn't just evaluation, it's compile time evaluation. For this final chapter, let's look at some of the more advanced inlining tricks that we can do with inline in Scala 3. Previously, all of our examples were about compile time evaluation of inline depth with only constant arguments. But what happens if some, but not all of the arguments are constants? Here we have an example with a power function that takes an integer x and raises it to the power of n. In our main method, we read an input, raise it to the power of 10, and print it. 
the compiler doesn't know what value x will take, but can it still simplify this piece of code? And the answer is yes. The compiler generates the following piece of code. We read an input x, then we compute x squared by computing x times x, and x to the power of 4 by computing x squared times x squared, then x to the power of 5 by computing x to the power of 4 times x, and finally x to the power of 10 by computing x to the power of 5 times x to the power of 5. And this is what we print. We call this partial evaluation because the compiler was able to evaluate part of the computation, but not the whole computation. Here, it evaluated the if blocks and the recursion, and the program at runtime only has input reading, multiplications, and printing to do. So a lot of the work has been pushed from runtime to compile time, and we've done a lot of work ahead of time. Another advanced inlining trick that we can do is transparent inline depths. If you recall our Fibonacci example from before, the compiler was able to simplify Fibonacci of 10 into 55. But somewhat frustratingly, the compiler cannot type check this as the type 55, even though it knows that Fibonacci of 10 is 55. And this is because the Fibonacci function returns an int and not the type 55. So we ask ourselves, can we fix this? And the answer is yes, with a transparent inline def. What we need is a way to tell the compiler, when you simplify this inline def, and you simplify it to something that is a more specific type than the return type of the function, please use the more specific type. And this is what the transparent keyword does. If we add the transparent keyword before the function definition of Fibonacci, we can now type check Fibonacci of 10 as a type 55. In this case, 55 is the more specific type, and int is the return type of the method. And this now type checks. Let's recap. We've seen that in Scala 3, we have a new keyword called inline. And we've seen that we can move code with inline def, inline val, and inline parameters. And we can also simplify code with inline if and inline matches. This is a form of better programming because it gives us inlining and constant folding, which together give us compile time evaluation, which is one of the goals of meta programming. You can think about it this way. Every time we call an inline def, we are generating a program. So a program that calls inline defs is actually a meta program. That's all for this video. Thank you for watching and happy inlining.